That was funny, Annie Barber talk. And she's like, uh, thank you, John. So um, how many of you are tired this morning? Would you raise your hand if you can? Uh, so um, just for context, I'm tired this morning as well. Uh, so we, we can understand each other. Okay, so Thursday, Friday, we were dropping off our son at college. And thank the Lord, it was incredible. Uh, Thursday was 14,000 steps, Friday was 18,000 steps, and the campus is not flat. Like, what in the heck? Okay, so then yesterday we had a family reunion at Catalina, which was really, really fun, and 16,000 steps. And a long, wow, the last few days have just been like, are you kidding me? Uh, but it was really fantastic. So, um, so I don't know if you just get tired from, you know, what's going on in life, and, and it keeps you from being thankful. So even if you're tired, find something to be thankful for right now, right? And say, okay, Lord, I'm breathing, I'm here with your people, and I'm going to learn from you, and keep me awake, okay? And if I doze off, just throw something at me or just say amen really loud. In fact, Len Krukowski is not here, so you guys in this section are going to have to be the amen people, Okay, or right on. Okay, there we go. Okay, good job. So we have been in a series on the Psalms, um, which we very creatively entitled Summer in the Psalms. Uh, and, but it has been pretty great learning from these uh, songs that were sung in the temple and at worship for families and on the way to Jerusalem and in good times and in hard times. And man, they've gotten pretty real. So if you've missed any of those, I mean, there was one on repentance and restoration. Uh, there was one on being depressed. Uh, last week was about when to praise the Lord and how to praise the Lord, reasons to praise him. And we shared, it was from Psalm 100, which is a blast. And we shared stories from Hume Lake Camp. We had some baptisms at the end of the service, which was really, really fun. And so uh, if you missed it, just check that out. And those things are on YouTube. They're on Spotify. You can catch up. And, um, and I know some of you do that. We've had actually more people watching online recently. So hi, everybody out online. But that has been awesome. So praise the Lord. And hi, Annika in Sweden. Uh, hi, Alexander in Germany. Hi, Jonathan in Wisconsin. So we love you guys. Uh, so today, Psalm 119. Shortest chapter or longest? Okay, uh, any idea how many verses are in it? He got it right. You were really close. You were dyslexic like, like I am. So 176 verses, and they all carry one theme. That's interesting. Well, any idea what the theme is? Love for God's word. And so I know many of you thought God's word, but, you know, how do you... Exp it's all about loving, his, being passionate about God's word. And, and so... Um, I thought it'd be interesting to just start for a second and just think for a second, what is it that you love about God's Word? And I want to have a few of you just yell out a phrase. So, go ahead. Refreshing. What? Refreshing. It's the truth. Wisdom. 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 Speaks to you. Grounds you. Life. It's life. It's encouragement. Comforting. 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 Consistency. Life, love, gladness, power. That's a, you guys are good. That is a good, see that just, I didn't even warn you, and that's what's, that's what's in you. So, so I want to first of all just say amen. And I agree with what you just said about God's word, and I hope that you heard something that was a little surprising and encouraging to you, and you're like, hey, wait, I need that. I want strength, I want encouragement, I want wisdom, I want truth. And you'll find that in his word. So, so let's talk about 119. It has a couple of famous verses in it that you have heard before. How can a young person keep their way pure? Right? And then, uh, and then your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And you remember that, that old song, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. That is right there in Psalm 119. 
And we could go on. There are some other ones that you have probably heard of. It's also a work of literary beauty. So the first eight lines all start with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then you go through it, and it goes on and on through 22 stanzas, and then each one is dedicated to a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that is a sign of completion, that now we have talked about God's word for 176 verses, and we have gone through the gamut, right? We've completed uh, this, this discussion about God's word, which I think is beautiful. Some people have tried to put a lot of structure on it. So you can find all kinds of YouTube videos, articles, even books about here is why. It has these ones here, and it mirrors these ones over here, and stanza one corresponds to stanza seven, and then these words are, uh, for God's word, are used here, and then they repeat here and there and there and there and over here, and that means this. I think people have worked really hard to try to find a, a system or a pattern. I think a better way of looking at this psalm is that this is a kaleidoscope, looking at God's word from a whole bunch of different angles of why it's important to everybody all the time in all kinds of situations, in all kinds of ways, and it's living and active, and so it, it literally changes its, its message in your life based on what you need right then. So it's like, what? So I think what Psalm 119 is saying is take the big picture in mind and see how huge God's word is in your life and don't discount it. And and don't see it as some book that's on the shelf that you neglect, but see it as this massively important creative uh, uh, opportunity, this, this voice that the Lord can have in your life no matter what you are going through. And it's multicolored and beautiful. It's interesting, right? Uh, So it talks about the law, which is Hebrew word Torah. And and that literally means the teaching or the message or the telling. And it's God telling us about himself, and it's sharing his truth about life and the world. So that's the telling. And then it has eight other synonyms, eight other similar related words in Hebrew that are in place of that word Torah and give us a slightly different angle on God's word. So so here are a couple of them. The testimony or testimonies, the way or the path that we should go on, God's precepts, his statutes or his charges to us, hey, Linda, do this, Uh, his commands or commandments, his judgments, uh, it's almost like a legal word, his written word, or his spoken word. And the spoken word is an interesting word because it also means promises. So you have all of these different things that God's word is, and as you're reading in, in, Psalm, in Psalm 119, it might say that his statutes are good and pleasing, and it might also say his written words are good and pleasing. And then it might say his written word is life and truth, and it might say his, his written word will light up your path. They're all true. And, and it's just cool to see how complex it is in some ways, but also very simple because it's not hard to understand. You can read it and go like, oh yeah, if I do this, it will help me, <laughs> right? So, so I think one of the reasons why it's the longest chapter is because we, you know, sometimes our skulls are a little thick and it may take 100 verses to penetrate. And then the last 76 can actually get in there and, and do some good on us. So, uh, so let's read a section of it. I was going to have you stand for 45 minutes and just read it. I'm going to be nice to you today, but I do want to have you promise me this. Read it this week. So grab your Bible, and you know, take, it'll only take you maybe 15 minutes to get through it. But just sit down and go slowly. Don't rush it. Don't make it like a, a school assignment. Um, but allow yourself to meet with the Lord through the psalm. If, if you want to, listen to it in the car when you're driving somewhere. I did that in a couple different translations this last week. It was really cool. So, um, so spend some time in 119 and read it, listen to it, just get some time alone and let it soak in on you. Okay? So let's stand up as I read some verses from uh, Psalm 119. I'm going to read 9 through 18. And it goes like this. 
How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. As I meditate on your precepts and I consider your ways, I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. We'll come back to that in a minute. Be good to your servant while I live, that I may obey your word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. The word of the Lord, you can be seated. So how can you possibly know God's will in this day and age, in this crazy world we live in, with so much information, with all that's going on, by following God's word? So that hasn't changed. Um, Some seasons, some uh, nations, some uh, eras, some, you know, times in history are more difficult than others, and some are easier than others. God's word has not changed. And it is the thing that doesn't change, that you can count on, that you can learn from no matter what. Um, How can you possibly stay on the straight and narrow path with all the stuff that's being thrown at you by your culture right now? How can you possibly avoid getting stuck in sin and sidelined and stuck in the ditch in your Christian life? By following God's word. Yeah, I mean, right? And, And I would have said that in 1971, And I would say that now. And I would have said that in 71. And I would have said that in 71 BC. And I would have said that in uh, 1017 BC. Because that's about when this was written. And it would be the same answer. Right? So sometimes we think that we're so smart and so different. And our time is so difficult. And, you know, it's never been like this before. And it's so much harder to follow Jesus now than when people were fed to the lions. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe we're okay. Um, so let's remember the big picture. Um, God's word. God will not bless you for having his word. Okay, I have three Bibles at home, you might say. God will not bless you for reading his word. I read his word this morning. God will not bless you for memorizing his word. You might, you know, maybe, maybe. Um, God will not bless you for studying his word. He'll bless you for what? Doing it. Doing what it says. There are a lot of people that teach the Bible that don't believe the Bible. You can go to a whole bunch of colleges and learn in religious studies about this book as literature, but it's taught by someone who is not living it out, it's not changing their life, and their life is not changing someone else's for the better. Right? True? True? In fact, there are some atheists who study the Bible more than you do. That's weird. Uh, Why is that? Because they find wisdom. They find nuggets for life. They find some truth in here, and then they pick and choose which parts they like and which parts they don't like. So God doesn't bless you for having it or reading it. He blesses you for doing it, for putting it into action, because it is living and active, and you're a living, breathing human being, most of you. And then God is doing something in you, right, for his good and his purpose, and it becomes alive in you. Like that song we sang, alive in you, right? That's what we are called to be. And if we do his word, not just read it, if we do it, there are a whole bunch of blessings listed in Psalm 119. Like, I'm going to give you half of them. Like, so check these out. We are these things. We are blessed. We are cleansed. We're healed from sin. Our souls are satisfied. (laughs) Give me some of that. We are revived. We're strengthened. We're saved. We're comforted. We're free. We receive mercy. We have hope. We're not ashamed. We become wise. And it's actually interesting. It says, I'm wiser than my teachers. Some of you thought you were wiser than your teachers. You can actually be wiser than your teachers. We avoid evil. We know the path. We know the truth. And we're filled with praise and we're filled with awe at who God is and how he works in our lives and the good words that he gives us. That's, that's a heck of a list. 
I mean, and you, you can dive into 119. You could double that. You could triple that list if you just spent time and said, like, what does this one mean? What's the benefit in, in this verse? So uh, when you meet with God in and through his word. Okay, so notice I said two things. I'm, I'm meeting with God because he wrote it. I'm also picturing that he is here with me as I'm reading, right? In and through his word. And I do that day in, day out over years. Do you know what happens? You feel an increasing connection with the author. You get closer to who he is. And you create a bond that can't be broken. And there's a stability and a strength of somebody that's in God's word for decades. Meeting with him through his word for decades. That makes you, it makes you unable for the enemy to tip you over which is interesting. And you'll find yourself changing from the inside out. And you'll see some stuff in you. People will see some stuff in you that wasn't there before. And you know what? You discover the way life is created to be. And so sometimes we don't live a life the way that God created it to be. And this is a really key part of it because we don't have a foundation. We don't have this connection with him daily through his written word. And we'll talk about excuses and why I haven't done that at times or maybe why you haven't done that at times. Um, but a couple of quotes. Thomas Merton, um, he's a Trappist monk and mystic. Love this guy. Um, he's not alive, but I want to meet him sometime. Um, but he said, by the reading of Scripture, I'm so renewed that all of nature seems renewed. The whole world is charged with the glory of God, and I feel fire and music under my feet. Woo! Right? So, so you might think, you know the Bible is pretty darn boring. Read Merton. Read some mystics. Read how they engage with God's word. And you'll be like, wait, I want that. And then make that into a prayer. Not, I just want that. But Lord, give, give me that kind of a relationship to you through your word. Because wow, look at that. Fire and music under my feet? Yes, please. Um, George Muller, so one of the founders of the Plymouth Brethren, and... Uh, he founded orphanages in England. You've probably heard of him. So he cared for over a thousand orphans uh, during his time. And I, I love this. He was accused um, of raising the poor above their natural station in British life. Yeah. So people were like, dude, leave the poor there. Like, why are you empowering and encouraging people who... And he's like, because Jesus did that, right? So he changed culture, right, by empowering people that the rest of culture looked at and went, nah. So he said, if you read, you start to move. After a few minutes, your soul is led into confession, thanks, praying for others, or just appreciating God. Spending time in God's word humbly and expectantly, I like that, usually turns into some kind of prayer. Do you want to develop your prayer life? Start with God's word. Whoa, right? So you might read a whole bunch of books about prayer, and you're like, that's great. But he says if you really read God's word the way it's supposed to be read and, the, and understand what he's trying to say to you, it's going to turn into conversation with the author. Duh. And so the enemy tries to keep us from having conversations with our creator who reached out to us through his word and said, here, spend some time with me, and I'm going to direct you. Wow. So God's word is a living tool that brings us into a living relationship with the living God. There's a verse that says God's word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. That's pretty sharp, right? And it divides bone and marrow. It, it divides what's going on in our lives. So, and the written word points us to what? The living word. And the book of John says that's Christ. And it uses the word logos. And so Jesus came to be the incarnation, the walking around of God's message on the planet. And God himself came and walked around and said, here's what I look like and here's what I act like and here's, I want to tell you some more things. Let me, let me, and, and the whole written word points to him. There was a guy that used to work at, at Calvary Community named Mike Markham. And the dude in his 80s was traveling Asia alone preaching. And, and like his, his kids we're trying to help us talk him out of it. Like, he's going to get hurt, he's going to get lost. He's get... So he's literally on trains 
like preaching a few times a day in Thailand and China and India and just jamming. So when he was at home and not doing that, he, he would challenge us as, as college students. And he would say, find a verse and I'll, I'll show you how it leads to Jesus. Any verse in the Bible, here, just find one. And then, you know, I would, I would find, I'm all smart, I'm a pastor's kid. So I'm like, okay, how does 10,000 donkeys and 15,000 camels lead to Jesus? He could do it. And he wasn't like at all, he's like, of course, I've done that one before. And he would just, you know, he would direct you from this verse to that passage, to this book, to Old Testament, New Testament, to Psalms, to the Messiah. And I'm like, dude, what? The whole thing, really, not just Mike, but for us, points to Christ coming. And then explains why he came and who he is in our lives. And then as we know him, the rest of it all starts to make even more sense. So he is, the living word lights up the written word, and the written word points to the living word. Pretty cool. Amen. Thank you, Len. So uh, <laughs> let's go back to two of the verses that we read. So verse 14, it says, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. So I want to ask a question. Do you rejoice in his statutes? Or do you read it and you shake your head and you're like, ah, oh, shoot, right? Or do you read it and just get bored and you move on to the next verse? Or do you rejoice when you see things in here? And which do you like more? Do you like earthly riches or theological riches? Or like, you know, here, here's a, something that I like to do, and I, and I have friends that do this, it, they see scripture as like a treasure hunt. So you're reading it and you're like, ooh, I like that. And then they'll write it on a sticky note and like put it on their computer or put it in their car and they're like, look at that. You know? And, and I, I think that's a great way of looking at scripture and understanding because um, Psalm 119.72 says, the law for your mouth, from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver or gold. That's a, like thousands? So, so do the math. Like, how much is an ounce of gold now? Is it two grand? 1,900 bucks? So thousands of those. It's like the pile of gold. Like, if there was a pile of gold here, you guys probably couldn't leave it alone, right? I mean, well, maybe in God's house, you'd be like, that must be offering. But <laughs> if, if there's a pile of gold out on Gainsborough, it would probably stop some traffic, right? So that's how we are to look at God's word. Like, whoa, thank you, Lord. And it's precious, and it's a commodity. It accomplishes something in my life. It's necessary for life. Like, give me some more of that, right? Okay. So then verse 16 says, I delight in your decrees. I, look at these words. I will not neglect your word. That's the thing that hit me this week. I will not neglect your word. And this is, this is not a legalism like, you better, read it, you better read at least three verses today, or you are neglecting God's word. I think that's a legalistic, simplistic, like kindergarten way of understanding it. I think a lot of us neglect God's word when we don't understand the importance of it. So you might read it today and still neglect it. Because you read it out of obligation, or it's what I do, or it's my habit, or I, I just do it because it helps me. But I think we can neglect his word if we neglect him in the reading of his word. Hmm. And, and so sometimes we neglect his word by neglecting the power that's in it, the authority that's in it, the purpose that's in it, the, the person who's behind it, who actually wrote it, I'm not picturing the author when I read his word. So, so here's something that I've done sometimes, and I want to encourage you. If, if you're jump-starting your devotional life and you want to spend some time with the Lord, make an appointment with him. Don't read it whenever you get around to it. And you might say, man, I start work at 6.30. That's fine. Figure out a time. I don't have your schedule. Um, there, there, um, there are a lot of, a lot of the famous like uh, names that you've heard of through history, Christian leaders from, you know, all the way through the last 22, you know, 2,023 years. 
Um, many of those people, actually it would be 1900 years, anyway, uh, many of those people, um, they started like very early in the morning in God's word and prayer. Like one person that, that I couldn't believe, Mark Wahlberg, wakes up super early in the morning, spends time with the Lord, and then works out, and then wakes up the kids, and then takes them to school and does this stuff. But he's like started at like three in the morning. And I'm like, dude, really? I don't know if I have that level of discipline, but there is something about being with the Lord early in the morning that is inconvenient and fantastic. I'm not a morning person, but I have become more of a morning person, and a lot of that has to do with him. Some of it has to do with my wife, but some of it has to do with him. And, and, and I feel like there, there's something lost when I'm not started with this. And, and I used to feel different about this. Like 20 years ago, I would say, just find your time. If it's day, if it's night, if it's your lunch break, if it's whatever. And, and I think I've become wiser. Right? <laughs> because there really is something about starting the day in his word. And, and if you have a stupid schedule, that will be harder. Still important. And if you do it listening in the car on your drive to work, great. If, it, if you have to drink an extra cup of coffee, great. If it takes you six months to get in the habit, great. But there's something about starting the day and getting into it and making an appointment and saying, like, Lord, at, at six, I'm going to be meeting with you. At seven, I'm going to meet, whatever it is. And here's the other thing. Pull out a chair for him. So it's hard to fall asleep if the creator has a chair in your kitchen. I'm serious. So if you're sitting in the easy chair and you're, you know, a quarter of a coffee in, and you're like, okay, I'm going to read Psalm 119. What verse are we on again? Right? That's different than if I'm sitting in an uncomfortable chair on purpose, right? And I pull out a, a more comfortable chair for the Lord, and I'm like, okay, Lord, teach me. Here I go. It's disrespectful to fall asleep on the Lord, right? Now, there are times when you read at, late at night, you will fall asleep, and he gets it, right? But there's something about having a chair out for him, having a place for him, having a, picturing him in, in the passenger seat of your car while you're driving to work and saying, Lord, teach me while I'm listening to this. There's something about making it special, making it different, not making it like homework right? Are you hearing me? Okay. Okay. So, but you might say, um, it's just so boring. I don't like it. I don't think that is evil to say that. I don't think you have sinned to say that. I think you have called out something about your context and your experience. And then what I would do is bring that to the Lord and say, Lord, this is how I feel. I'm kind of ashamed to say that. And I would also bring that to some people in your life and say, this is how I feel, and see what they say about it. Hopefully they won't judge you, but they'll help you. And, and I think often when we see it as boring, it's because we see ourselves in judgment over it rather than it in judgment over us. And when it is in judgment over us, that ceases to be boring, and it, see, it becomes a little more challenging, a little more like, oh, crud, i got to do what it says now. This way, I don't have to do what it says because it's boring and... I, I, got, I don't got time for that. That? That's not that. That's why we have 176 verses of saying like, no, this is real. This is real and living and active and powerful and beautiful and, and amazing. But if I'm thinking I'm better than that, that's where the enemy wants you. He wants you to think this is not for you. This is for other normal people. Now, what's funny is um, I, I, I feel like men, I feel like we have this worse. I don't know why. There's something about pride in some men where we're like, you know, I, that's for other people. They can read the Bible, but I've got to go to work. I got this, I got, I got to provide, I got to, I got to accomplish, I got to, that's, I think that's a lie from the enemy that just pervades our culture. Here's another lie that is primarily for guys. I'm not a reader. I, I'm off the hook now. Check the box. I don't have to read the Bible because I'm not a reader. So 3,000 years ago, a lot of people were not readers, right? They did not learn um, in school like you did. Many of them did learn how to read, but a lot of them didn't. 
And so what happened 3,000 years ago was they didn't check the box and go, I don't need to know God's word. No, they memorized it. They heard it out loud. They applied it to their lives because it was God's words, not some book. And it was the book, the driving force for their culture, and they understood it's God's language in, in me that I need to understand and apply and act on. They didn't check the box and move on. So if, if you feel like it's boring or if you feel like you're not a reader, I want to just tell you BS. I do. And so that, that was who you used to be, and now you get to be right. You get to have a new deal and walk forward with the Lord without excuses. Because I don't want to end up in heaven someday, and the Lord's like, so how did it go? And I'm like, well, I had these problems. I thought your word was really boring. Okay, just picture that. How's that conversation going? And you're like, and you didn't give me the ability to read very well. And the Lord's like, that's all you got? Like, those are your excuses for not doing what I created you to do? Right? And I believe you cannot do what God has created you to do without his word. Okay. Thank you again, Len, for those amens. <laughs> so um, the, the last thing is this. I feel like some, and I've heard some people say this, I don't need to read it because I listen to podcasts and I listen to sermons. And I, Lord knows I got Fox News. Like I've got everything I need. And, and so I, I was thinking about this yesterday and my sister said something funny when we were walking at Catalina, my sister Cindy, she said, it's kind of like eating pre-chewed food. How many of you enjoy, how many of you today are going to go out to lunch for pre-chewed food? Right? Like, that's, that just freaks me out. I hope, I hope that freaks you out, too. So there is nothing wrong with listening to podcasts. There is, there is nothing wrong with, uh, with listening to sermons. Sometimes there is something wrong with Fox News. Now, not always, but sometimes. Uh, you didn't smile or laugh. Well, like two people are laughing right now. Okay. So, but, but here's the thing. Like, we need to learn from the source first. And that gives you a, a filter and perspective and a foundation for all the other voices coming at you. Because sometimes you trust a voice that turns out to be not trustworthy. Because you didn't have a foundation. I see that every day. And, and so we got to be primarily in his word, primarily listening to him, spending time with him. And then, hey, add to that. That's great. You can add to your diet. Um, but make sure that you're getting some stuff straight from him primarily. Amen. Okay. Uh, so, so, and as you're studying God's word, this is another thing that sometimes we do. People get comfortable when they read it. Because it's true. Have you ever told someone the truth and they were uncomfortable? So, so I love this quote. Flannery O'Connor said, the truth doesn't change according to your ability to stomach it. That's boom, right? So there are times when you're going to read and you're going to be like, I don't like this. I am uncomfortable with this. I, I remember having conversation with Jeremy um, about reading some of the Old Testament judgment passages. And I was like, wait, how do I like, reconcile that with Jesus saying, love those, love your enemies, like, and pray for those who persecute you, and then kill them, right? Like, how does, what, how does this even jive? Um, and, and that is the right kind of stuff to engage with the Lord in, and let me say this, and in a community group, because there's, the Lord has given us uh, a community and fellowship with each other, because Christianity is a team sport, if you try to do it alone, you're going to get frustrated, um, and, and you're going to have issues that you can't solve on your own, and you can't think through on your own, because part of it is this interplay of, I don't understand it. And then Linda might say, I know, and here's what the Lord's been showing me about that. Oh, so s suddenly it, it loses some of its stigma, it loses some, I'm not afraid of the subject anymore. We just talk about it. And, and the Lord is okay with you bringing him beefs and saying, I don't get it, and asking for his help in them. And there are times when he will answer you. There are times when in discussion you'll have answers. And there are times when the Lord will say, that's on a need-to-know kind of basis, and you don't need to know it right now. 
It's, that's how it works. But, but here, here's the thing. We can't discount the truth because we don't like it. And, and in our culture, there are a lot of truths that people are running away from at breakneck speed because they're uncomfortable and difficult and they, they seem hard to apply. And, and we still need to engage the Lord in his truth and remember that Jesus came full of two things, grace and truth. Often we have one or the other. He had both in superpower. And I think in this book you find the same thing, grace and truth traveling together all the time. Good time for amen or right on. Okay. Um, so I want to have the band come up, and I'm going to start wrapping this up, which thankfully I'm not a Baptist preacher because that means I'm like halfway through. <laughs> or or the, old, the old thing is like a, a Baptist preacher, they tell you what they're going to tell you, then they tell you, then they told you what they told you. Oh, man, love that. Um, so personally, I used to neglect God's word a lot. And, and I neglected it in all of the ways we just talked about, and I knew better. I'm a pastor's kid. Like, really? Yes, really. And there are many times when I did not read his word in the morning, and I didn't read it at all, and, and there are other seasons in my life when I read it out of obligation, just to get through, because I'm like, fake it till you make it, right? I just got to do this, and I'm not loving it. And and I really feel like over time, the Lord met me in that, even in that lack of faith, lack of discernment, lack of wisdom, lack of maturity. And, and he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work in your life anyway, and over time, you're going to figure this out. And, and I just feel like I have felt the Lord's grace and kindness, even in my neglect of his word. And I don't know if you've felt that. And, and so, so I feel like right now the Lord wants to come alongside of you and say, so, what are you going to do now? And probably for most of us, there's something that we learned this morning, something we need to apply. And, and I don't think it's, it's like this, you know, demanding, commanding finger of the Lord, like, you better get your act together. I think that the enemy does that. But the Holy Spirit does, let's go do this together. I want to help you. I want to go with you. Let's, let's grow you into who you're supposed to be. And, and the Holy Spirit is saying, and my word is something that you've been neglecting. And let's change that together. Let's get on the road. Isn't that cool? I mean, and, and that's, that's a beautiful invitation for us to grow up. And, and become uh, much more, much more like, our, like our Lord. So how many of you like coffee in the morning? I'm a coffee person. So what if you, um, what if you saw God's word like that? Like, I need this to help me. I need this to perk me up. I need this to give me the energy that I need. So when you look at your coffee maker or your Keurig or your pour over or your what else do you have? French press. When do you stop out in front of Starbucks? <laughs> Hopefully, just, just remember, the Lord's word's more important than that. It's going to give you way more life than that, and it doesn't drop you. Right? Okay. Um, so what is the Lord saying to you uh, from what we've talked about? Just, just spend a minute with him, and, and you guys can start playing instrumental if you want in the back. But just Spend, spend a minute with him and say, Lord, what is the next step? Uh, for some of you, it's, it's going to be starting a daily discipline because you're like, man, I am hit and miss. Sometimes I meet with him and sometimes I miss it and I, I just got to get consistent. And, and for some of you, it's been duty, obligation, boring. It needs life. And so just say, Lord, would you breathe life into my reading of your word? Would you breathe life into my days? as I start days with you. Some of you, it might be getting a new Bible because you have a Bible that doesn't really work. It's, it doesn't have tools in it. It's not in language that you understand. It, 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 you got to get a new Bible and start this new routine and, and get going. And we have some in the lobby, but there are nicer ones online. 
And if you need help finding one, ask me. Ask Steve. He's been down this road for a little while. Um, and we'll help, we'll help you figure out, like, what's the right Bible for you, for you right now? Some of you may need to go, join a community group. And, and there's something about being in community with others where you're reading God's word and you can ask questions and you can hear other people processing his word and, and, and it helps you have this accountability to grow. And, and I also, I feel like an ability to grow healthy and quicker. And, and it's like ex, your, your growth is accelerated when you're growing with others. There just isn't, isn't another way around that. Um, and here's a baby step. We're doing uh, devotionals on the Bible app. And so I want to just ask you if you want to join that. Um, we're doing one called Oxygen for the Soul that starts tomorrow. It's based on Psalm 119. And so if you go to the Bible app and you go into plans, um, you'll find it. If you want to do it with all of us, just become my friend on the Bible app. I'll help you figure that out if you don't know how. And I can invite you to be part of that. And you can comment, you can read, you can read other people's processing of God's word. And that's a baby step. It's, it's a good way of just getting into it if you're not used to the, to the discipline. All right? So we're going to sing a song that um, was really on my heart earlier this week that I, I hope will speak to you from what the Lord wants to say about wh what we've talked about this morning in your life. Uh, but, but I was thinking about this quote from Spurgeon. How many of you are Spurgeon fans? Did you raise your hand? So um, he said, uh, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. That is so true. Some of the most tattered Bibles are owned by saints that I respect so deeply. They got underlines, they got notes, they got all this stuff going on in there. And it's just, there's something about that. Now, some of you grew up in a tradition where you don't write in it because you don't mess it up. I want to encourage you to start tattering your Bible. Use it up, you know, allow it to be part of you. And, and if your life is falling apart, maybe your Bible is too clean. Your Bible is too perfect. Your Bible is not messed up because your life is keeping you from being in there. So, okay, you got it? Okay, so let's... Let's stand up and, and I'm going to pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your words that bring life. Thank you for your truth that cuts into every part of our lives and makes things right. And so, Lord, I ask for forgiveness for some of us who have neglected your word. May we change that even today and, and start some new disciplines tomorrow. And Lord, I ask that it wouldn't be like a New Year's resolution that's just a flash in the pan, but it would be a new way of meeting with you that would last for decades. And Lord, I ask that you would change us through your word. I ask that you would change our community as you change us. And I ask, Lord Jesus, uh, that you would uh, point us to you through everything that we read. And Lord, that you would be the center. May we not put the Bible above you. But Lord Jesus, may we see you in and through it. And I ask that in Jesus' name. And everybody said? And everybody online said? Okay.